Welcome to Securing America with me, Frank Gaffney, the program that's a kind of owner's manual for protecting the country we love. Let's get to it. The recent revelations from Hunter Biden's abandoned laptop are simply stunning to anyone with a background in national security. The emails, photos, and videos found on it not only document the owner's pathetic decline into personal dissolution, drug addiction, and moral depravity, they portray a huge liability for his father while he was the serving vice president of the United States and potentially a ticking time bomb for our country in the future. To be sure, the conduct of others in the Obama administration, including notably that of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, created similar vulnerabilities to blackmail, extortion, or other forms of manipulation by hostile powers. Still, the record that is now becoming clear is one of more or more of uh, Joe Biden's family cashing in, in Hunter's case, massively on the then vice president's official position. It appears that Pop, or the big guy, actually had a piece of the action as well. Among those providing the cash were not only corrupt businessmen in a relatively friendly country like Ukraine, it also flowed from the wife of a kleptocratic mayor of Moscow, a crony of Russia's Vladimir Putin, who is an avowed enemy of the United States. And billions of dollars were provided by the Bank of China, a state-owned enterprise of our most dangerous adversary, the Chinese Communist Party. It will likely take a serious investigation to unravel fully precisely what all these corrupting elements got for their money, from what the former anti-mafia prosecutor Ruli Giuliani has described uh, very vividly. Let's take a look at this tape. In future days, you will see texts, emails, and photos that demonstrate crimes committed by the Biden crime family. The Biden crime family. By the way, the man who will forever be known as America's mayor played to his credit a critical role in bringing Hunter's laptop to light after the FBI reportedly sat on its contents for perhaps as much as a full year. Congressional Republicans and President Trump are now calling for the appointment of a special prosecutor to conduct just such an investigation. One hugely consequential quid pro quo is already in plain sight, however. In May of 2013, then-Vice President Biden was instrumental in negotiating a bilateral U.S.-China Memorandum of Understanding that afforded the CCP access to America's capital markets without requiring its front companies to abide by U.S. securities laws and regulations. As those statutes and regulations were designed to protect investors, most of them Americans, from undisclosed material risk and financial liabilities, this sweetheart arrangement ensured that the Chinese were not only able to attract Americans' investment dollars, they were able to do so on behalf of companies that in some cases at least are engaged in malevolent and or fraudulent activities. Incredibly, some of these Chinese corporations have been identified by the Pentagon as communist Chinese military companies. Why on earth would we want our countrymen and women to be presumably, unwittingly, underwriting the businesses of the PRC's military industrial complex, whose primary mission is building weapon systems with which to kill us? Then. Six months after Mr. Biden's MOU was signed, his son, Hunter, was given $1.5 billion by the Bank of China for his firm to invest. This extraordinary windfall is so huge it would not appear to qualify as a bribe so much as a commission on the estimated $3 trillion the Chinese Communist Party has been able to extract from U.S. capital markets thanks to the one-sided bilateral deal engineered by Joe Biden. Whatever the amounts involved and whatever the extent of former Vice President Biden's personal knowledge of his son's business dealings with the Chinese Communists, let alone his own enrichment at their hands, one thing is clear. The evidence of massive corruption in the Biden family is a vulnerability that would deny any ordinary government employee or contractor a security clearance even if it were not evidence of criminal wrongdoing, 
it would be an intolerable vulnerability and grounds for prohibiting access to classified or other sensitive information. Now, the Vice President of the United States, or for that matter, the President of the United States, are not an ordinary government employee. And they don't, as elected officials, have to receive the same permission to have access to classified information. Something that ought to be re-examined after this caper in particular. Now, four decades ago, I worked for Senator Henry Scoop Jackson of Washington State, a tremendous United States Senator. He was a lifelong and proud Democrat back when most in that party took national security seriously and prized good, albeit big, government. I'm trying to imagine the conversation that Scoop Jackson would be having at the moment with his party's nominee, with whom he served, by the way, in the Senate for a decade, the guy who is the candidate to be president of the United States for the Democrats. I'm pretty sure it would be short and to the point, maybe even just one word, withdraw. After all, it's inconceivable that any American political party, even one that has moved since Scoop Jackson's day so far to the extreme left, that any political party would want the voting public to believe that it finds the Biden's evident misconduct and attendant vulnerabilities to be acceptable, let alone a basis for promotion to the highest position in the land. While the Democrats' transparent plan is, if they can manage it by hook or more likely by crook, to get Joe Biden across the finish line and then promptly replace him with Kamala Harris, they will be forever tarred with the implications of accommodating and promoting behavior that imperils the national security and makes a mockery of ethical and accountable governance. If the Democratic Party does indeed tolerate such behavior, I'm convinced it will form the basis of one of the most profoundly troubling aspects of the choice we must make in the next two weeks. A choice that on so many different fronts, as we're trying to address day after day after day here at Securing America, cannot be overstated in terms of their importance for you and your children and your children's children. Those are my thoughts. Let me know yours and learn how you can help with all of this at our new website, securingamerica.tv. We'll talk about SCOTUS, the Supreme Court, next.
We're back. I'm very pleased to welcome to the show for the first time Jessica Anderson. She is the terrific executive director of Heritage Action. She's been deeply involved in the nomination of Judge Amy Coney Barrett to be an associate justice on the U.S. Supreme Court. She's, of course, been following very closely the Senate's deliberations, which are expected to reach a critical decision point tomorrow afternoon when the Judiciary Committee is expected to approve Judge Barrett's confirmation. You can find out more about Jessica's work at heritageaction.com and follow her on Twitter at Jess Anderson 2 Jessica, it's great to have you with us at Securing America, especially at this really important juncture. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the judge and how things have shaped up uh, thus far in her nomination. Well, Frank, thank you so much for having me today. Judge Barrett is an exceptionally qualified judge. She is well poised to not only move through this confirmation process, but should she be successful and find a seat on the Supreme Court, she will be an originalist. She is a textualist by training. She loves the law. She seeks to interpret it, to uphold the Constitution. As she said many times this last week, she does not have a policy agenda. She's not arriving to the court to advance some secret uh, you know, agenda in the way that the liberal left does as they pack the courts with their people. Um, this is not that, and she's a, she is a welcome breath of fresh air to the highest court of the land. She is indeed, and it's a great credit, I think, to President Trump that he selected her and to the Republican majority that they are moving so smartly to get her confirmed. And honestly, I, I can't imagine a better candidate. Uh, she mm -hmm. just seems to be uh, a rock star in every single respect. Um, talk a little bit about the criticisms that uh, the left has leveled against her, uh, Jessica, uh, in terms of uh, some of the substantive positions they impute to her. and. Um, her faith uh, practice, uh, which I think was probably not quite as much uh, uh, seen a uh, uh, target of their attacks this time around as in her previous um, hearings for the appellate court. But give mm -hmm. us a flavor of that. Well, I think the attacks from the left right now really are falling flat. I mean, they, they started down this you know, these personal attacks of her faith, her family, even the New York Times had a piece just this last weekend on whether or not her adoptive children from Haiti uh, was above board and, and, you know, was that done legally? Um, the, the, the answer is this, this woman, her family, um, they have impeccable integrity. They operate at just such a higher level, and that clearly shows that none of these personal attacks are landing. They're not sticking. There's no there there. And so, you know, that when you have an exceptional exceptionally qualified individual underneath the microscope at this level, it's nice to see that nothing sticks. Now, as far as some of the, the policy aspects that are at play, yes, the Democrats used their time in the Senate Judiciary hearing last week to try to get commitments from her on where she would fall down on health care or Roe v. Wade or Heller and the Second Amendment cases. You know, I, I watched that closely. I watched it happen. My, my reaction to it is this is just simply Democrats and the liberal left, again, trying to use the courts to advance a policy and agenda. What they should be asking is, will you as a judge uphold the Constitution? And yes, there were some of those questions, but unfortunately, too many Democrats use their time to get those YouTube clips so that they could use them for their future election needs this cycle. Yes. You know, and uh, let's be honest, I think very few of them are really interested in having a judge who is going to stick to and mm -hmm. judge on the basis of the Constitution of the United States. That's not where they come down. Speaking of where they come down, uh, Jessica, talk a little bit about the threat that has now been pretty explicitly made if this nomination does go through. If she, Judge Barrett is actually Justice Barrett on the U.S. Supreme Court, that she's going to have a lot of company um, because the court is going to be packed by people who aren't interested in the original intent of the founders or the, you know, letter of, uh, of the Constitution. Where are we on the court packing threat as you see it and uh, the flim flammery that we've been getting out of the Democratic uh, presidential ticket? 
Well, first and foremost, I think this whole conversation around court packing shows just how far the extreme left is willing to go to advance their agenda. They don't like that the president has the constitutional power to nominate someone this close to the election. They result in these sorts of threats. And so when we define court packing, it's important to be clear about what it means. What they're saying to do is to add additional liberal justices to the Supreme Court bench, taking it from nine to as many as 13, 15, 17, really no end in sight. So it is a real threat. Obviously, the filibuster in the Senate is the last line of defense against potential court packing in the future. And I'm hopeful and encouraged that so many senators have come out on record opposed to it. Now, what we haven't seen, though, is Vice President Biden denounce the effort or try to separate himself from the liberal wing of his party. He hasn't done that because he knows he needs those voters. And he isn't embracing court packing because he needs those undecided voters in the middle. So he is he's walking a very thin line politically here. But I think at the end of the day, we should all assume that Vice President Biden is going to be beholden to the liberal extreme part of the party and is comfortable with court packing and adding those justices to the bench if it gets him what he needs for his policy agenda. Yeah, it's really been an extraordinary performance. At one point, as you know, Jessica, Vice President Biden actually said the voters aren't, uh, I think he said, uh, don't deserve to know what my position is. He seems to have walked that back a bit since and said actually that he'll tell us what his position is before um, the election. I'd be very interested to see if given the tightrope he's walking, he actually does that. Uh, Jessica, obviously we don't want to uh, jinx anything here, but uh, your informed assessment of where things are likely to be this time tomorrow, um, if uh, if this confirmation vote takes place in the Senate Judiciary Committee and uh, the prospects for the floor in the days ahead. Well, my sense is, is that we don't need to t- we don't want to take anything for granted. Um, you know, it's not done till it's done. She will have her Judiciary Committee vote tomorrow at 1 p.m. here at the Senate. I expect she will advance from the committee. Uh, McConnell has said he hopes to meaning a favorable vote out of the committee and Jessica we're just hard out of time I think that portends well for the final vote on the floor uh, probably on Monday thank you for your time today and for the great work you're doing at the Heritage Foundation Uh, excuse me Heritage Action come back to us soon if you would I hope the rest of you will do the same right after this
Welcome back. We're going to have next a conversation about the founders of our country, who have been, of course, much maligned of late by contemporary revolutionaries. Specifically, we're going to explore with two of America's most thoughtful students of the framers of our constitutional republic a most topical question. Did those extraordinary men anticipate today's revolutionary times? And if so, in what ways have they equipped us to address them? Our guests for that purpose are Anne Sorok, a behavioral scientist who serves as the president of the Frontier Center, and David Barton, an historian and the founder of Wall Builders. His most recent book is The American Story, The Beginnings. Anne and David, thank you for joining us for, as I say, a most I think needed discussion of a topic that, uh, especially in the post-election period, may be very much upon us, namely a full-on revolution. Um, let's start with how the framers, who of course were revolutionaries themselves, uh, many of them, uh, were informed in putting together this constitutional republic, uh, David Barton, by that experience and kind of baked it into uh, their founding documents. Yeah, it's interesting. The revolutionaries really thought the British were the revolutionaries. As John Adams said, in America, they created a government of laws, not of men. Mm -hmm. And they really felt like that King George III particularly had become the revolutionary. He was no longer following laws. Um, I, I was reading even yesterday John Adams' works. John Adams says that, that what we call the revolution, they called a civil war, but it started in 1761 with writs of assistance. When James Otis went before the courts and, or, and argued against writs of assistance, which were the British just arbitrarily coming into your home and doing what they wanted and taking what they wanted and arresting who they wanted. Then you follow that in 1765 with the Stamp Act tax. So you're not allowing us to have a voice and you're taxing us with no voice. And it goes through one instant after another of what they called a violation of basic governmental constitutional rights. And they were well read, well informed in the writings of John Locke and Montesquieu and so many others. And so they felt like it was Great Britain that had done the revolution, which is why they would not let American soldiers fire until they had been fired upon. Mm. Because they wanted it really clear that this is not us creating the revolution. We're standing for right. And if you're going to take us on over us standing for right, we'll do that. And, and again, in the early years, the Founding Fathers called it the American Civil War. So we call them revolutionaries today, but quite frankly, they were standing for the rule of law. Um, they were very conscious about not being rebellious in attitude. Uh, John Adams actually carried a, a book in his saddlebags from 1689 by Junius Brutus called A Defense of Liberty Against Tyrants, which is the theological look at when is it appropriate to be able to say no to government? When is civil disobedience right? And so they really were principle driven, not in the in the sense of the lawless crowds and the type of destructive, uh, the wanton destructiveness we see today. Uh, it's, it's not the same thing as what we later saw with the Whiskey Rebellion or Shays Rebellion or, or things in the early stages of the Republic that really were revolutionaries uh, trying to overthrow something. The Founding Fathers really were driven by law and principles. That's such an important corrective, and I, I thank you for sharing it with us, David. Uh, it reminds me kind of of my old boss, Ronald Reagan, saying, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. Uh, and this is, I guess, very much what uh, the founders felt was taking place in our country as Britain left us, in a sense, uh, with this uh, revolutionary view. Um, Ansarok, uh, this is a subject that I know you have been thinking hard about, um, and is a very much imbued as you are, uh, as your uh, frontier center is, with the traditions of this country and the values of this country and how we need to get back to them. When you hear this explanation, uh, is, is that surprising to you, or is that, in fact, um, very much what you have read in your reading of the history as well? I think I understand it the same way. In fact, I go back to 1620, the Mayflower Compact, when we first, you know, American self-governance had evolved long before even the Constitution. And so when in our research, as we are tracking what is going on in the minds of the American people, we keep hearing them talk about the system is broken, and I say that system, the word system carefully, they aren't even articulating the Constitution, they aren't articulating um, 
any particular form of government. They are simply referring to it as the system. And so I think this is a moment with, um, for us to look back and say, what is that American system and when did it evolve? You know, the, the New York Times has pointed us to, towards 1619, um, but when was the founding of self-governance? And that will help us evaluate what is happening right now. Yeah, and, and in your research, and as I say, you're a serious social scientist uh, who's studying these things with extensive interviews of the individuals whose opinions you're trying to sample, uh, and this is not just a, a, a polling thing, this is a deep dive into the mindsets of those you're questioning. And you're, I know, looking into uh, the attitudes of people who are both in favor of that kind of uh, overthrow, if you will, of the structure, as well as people who don't want that. When you're talking to the former, when you're talking to those who are interested in a coup, perhaps, uh, for, to use one term, um, what is it about the structure that they seem to find so offensive? Is it, is it in fact, self-governance that they're objecting to? I think what it is is self-governance that they want. And they've been given a wholly wrong understanding of how that is achieved and what is what our current system is based upon. Because what we heard from those who are actual participants in what we can call a, a, an attempted coup is that they wanted to be heard. And so we talked to people, for example, who are out in the streets of Black Lives Matter who want to overthrow the American system. Again, we always hear system. Burn it and down, saying, some of them have said. <laughs> burn it down so that I can be heard. Um, they recounted to us that for the first time in their lives, many of them had been heard when they met, for example, with police officers. They'd never come in contact with the police officer in a positive situation. And so this movement was validating that they could now be heard. Well, that's their yearning, right, to be heard. And what other, what better way to be heard than self-governance? But we've gotten things a bit mixed up right now. Well, and that's what I want to come back to. We have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk with both uh, Anne Sorok and David Barton about are people being heard? Uh, if they're not being heard, why aren't they being heard? And is the upshot of a revolution of the kind that's now afoot with Antifa and the Black Lives Matter organization at its helm likely to result in self-governance or, for that matter, being heard by any of us? That and much more will be straight ahead. Stay tuned for more.
We're back, and I'm pleased to say we're continuing this conversation, a very, very timely and I think important conversation about the future course of our country with a bit of a look to the past as well. David Barton, you are a terrific historian, but you're also a close observer of current events. Um, let me ask you first about um, this idea that and has been brooding that uh, the people who are now unhappy and expressing that unhappiness in our streets, burning down cities, in some cases even killing people, um, are simply wanting to be heard. Um, does that sound as though that's what the leaders of this revolutionary activity have in mind, or is it something very different, and where will it end, do you think? Oh, it's not what the leaders have in mind. I think it is what the followers have in mind. Uh, one of the things that makes a very good revolution is having people who are historically ignorant. Mm. And we definitely know that that's the case in America today. Uh, we know that only 24% of Americans can name the three branches of government. 48% of elected officials cannot name the three branches of government. You can't wow. preserve a government that you don't know how it operates. So we're very historically unaware of who we are as a people. Uh, we're very historically unaware of even black history. Uh, we're unaware that in, prior to 1902, we had a number of black founding fathers we regularly talked about in textbooks. We stopped that after 1902 with Woodrow Wilson. We have no clue that blacks voted in most of the northern states. Uh, that, for example, there never was a time when blacks could not vote in Massachusetts. When the Constitution was ratified in Baltimore, 85% of blacks voted to ratify the Constitution in Baltimore. See, we get a southern view of, of, of black history. We get, a, we get a, really a Georgia and a South Carolina view. We don't get a Massachusetts and, and a Connecticut kind of view. And it, it, it makes a big difference whether you know history. The other thing I'd point out is they're wanting a voice, but it's real interesting to me that we keep a list, a very extensive list of the statues torn down and the monuments defaced. Mm -hmm. And across those monuments, you'll see BLM, Black Lives Matters, and right above it, you'll see a, a hammer and sickle, a, a, really the communist symbol. And so if you think that having a communist form of government is going to give you a voice, you definitely are historically illiterate. There has never yes. been a communist government in the history of the world that's given people a voice. And so here you are pushing for a communism and, and making that your symbol that goes side by side with BLM, and you're wanting a voice, and you're pushing yourself into a system where you'll never have a voice. Final thing I would say is most are unaware that the average length of a constitution in the history of the world is 17 years. The American government has been 233 years with the constitution. It really is nice not to have a revolution every 17 years or so and they don't understand that France wanted a voice and France has been through 15 revolutions since we've had just one so it's hugely important point David. literacy yeah is uh, not good and let me come back to your research um, do the folks that you're talking to who seek self-expression and self-governance seem to have any appreciation of what David just said um, uh, the history for one, but, but more to the point, where we are today, namely that these are Marxist enterprises, uh, Antifa, the Black Lives Matter organization at least, uh, led by avowed Marxists as uh, bent on, uh, as I said, burning down uh, the system. Is that evident to the folks who are following them? Almost no insider uh, ability to comprehend what they are aligning themselves with. Um, it's really sad. Um, so we are testing their their awareness of these terms, and they're they're not able to offer any definitions of any of these terms. Even something as basic as communism means nothing to them. They are getting their education right now in the midst of these protests, and they are saying seeing who is aligning with me, who is not, but. You know, I, we're, we're interested in them, and, it, and it's sort of a sad story of, as, as you say, historical illiteracy, but we're also looking at groups like suburban women who are attaching themselves to this movement, and people who perhaps are able to define communism for us, and yet they are still aligning with these groups. So there's, there's and why is it that? extends. And what's, what's, <laughs> what is motivating them as well? Is it, is it that basic same misconception as to what they're about? Um, it is a calculation um, that they have told us they are making that they are able, that they would rather not take on that weighty problem of entering into the fray. It, they, over and over, no matter what topic we study with suburban women in particular, they are overwhelmed by 
stress, essentially, and lack of peace of mind, they say. And when it comes to Black Lives Matter and these groups, they're a simp- they think a simple way of expressing support will make it all go away. Uh, and it, but it never resolves for them, yeah. and so there. It, it won't make it go away. It'll make, uh, I'm afraid, our republic go away. And David, uh, we've only got two minutes left, but very quickly, when you look at what's afoot now, uh, what in the founders sort of uh, playbook um, can help us contend with these forces, uh, the ignorance on the one hand, um, the cluelessness of, of, of what supporters are doing, um, aiding and abetting people who are going to take them into a direction that is very much at odds with what they say they want. Well, people right now are seeing the need for solutions, and there are solutions on the horizon, but unfortunately, none of them are quick solutions. It is We should have been doing this in education a while back. We should have been doing civics and government and better historical education, better racial education. We should have been doing that. Um, there were efforts underway by the administration to create the 1776 Commission to combat the 1619 co- Project. Great. But that's going to take people a while to learn that. So that does not stop what's in the streets. Uh, the closest thing we have is if the Republic preserves in the election and you keep a, a group of constitutionally minded judges. We have more constitutionally minded judges now than we've had in 40 years. I, I see that as a good preservative for the Republic as long as people are willing to go along with the rule of law. If they, if they don't want to go with the rule of law, there's not a quick solution out there. Yeah. This uh, brings us to the point that I was just talking about with Jessica Anderson of the Heritage Action Team about uh, Justice Amy Coney Barrett and why it's so important, I think, that we have a full Supreme Court in place for contending with uh, the possible breakdown of the rule of law. Um, Anne and and David, thank you so much for this. I, I just wanted to close by saying one of the things that might be helpful to all of you if you're concerned about what we've just been discussing, and you should be, obviously, is at our website, securingamerica.tv, you can get access for free to a PDF of a handbook. Uh, We're calling it, uh, Are You Safe? But it's a citizen's guide to insurrection and violence and how you can be prepared both to understand what's actually going on and be equipped to deal with it. And we appreciate being able to share that with our audience as well as with you two terrific experts. Thanks. Come back to us again, if you will, soon. Next up, Reggie Littlejohn about China and its attack on its own people.
Welcome back. It's a delight to say we have with us uh, one of my favorite people. Her name is Reggie Littlejohn. She's an internationally renowned freedom fighter who is the founder and president of a terrific organization, Women's Rights Without Frontiers. This is an international coalition whose mission is to expose and oppose forced abortion, gender side, and sexual slavery, notably in the Chinese People's Republic of China. You can find out a lot more about their work at womensrightswithoutfrontiers.org. Uh, she is also featured prominently in the terrific 2013 gender side documentary, It's a Girl. And you can follow Reggie Littlejohn on Twitter by her handle, at Reggie Littlejohn. Reggie, it's so good to have you with us. Welcome to Securing America. I've been delighted to have you Thanks. featured on Thanks. this program. Congratulations on your new show. It looks terrific. Thank you. Well, it's going to be terrific with the help of folks like yourself. So we want to talk with you about something we, we sort of uh, introduced. We had a warm-up back for you, I guess you'd say, uh, Reggie, with Steve Mosier on Friday, talking about the population control policies and, well, I think of it as infrastructure that the Chinese Communist Party has created uh, that has resulted in the the worst genocide in human history by far. Tell us about your insights into what they're doing and how that has given rise to this. Well, what, what they've done historically is September 25th was the 40th anniversary of the institution of the one child policy. Now the two child policy and they have what they, what they say is they have prevented 400 million lives through this coercive population control program, many hundreds of million by forced abortion, forced sterilization, and even infanticide. And when they shifted from a one-child policy to a two-child policy on September 1st of 2016, I believe it was, it, they, it was announced that they had abandoned the one-child policy, which made it seem like they had abandoned all coercive population control, but nothing could be further from the truth, and we see the evidence of that today in Xinjiang. Oh. I, I want to talk with you about Xinjiang, um, but before we do, uh, talk about how this has worked in practice, um, Reggie. One, you know, how they have enforced these policies, and, and what the upshot of it has been in terms of selective abortions uh, or infanticide, as the case may be. Well, they have done this through a vast infrastructure of what I have called womb police, who function basically as domestic terrorists. Mm. And they've had, they have done horrific human rights abuses with no repercussions to them at all, including dragging women out of their homes, strapping them down to tables, forcibly aborting them up to the ninth month of pregnancy. Some of these forced abortions have been so violent that the women themselves have died along with their full-term babies, forced sterilizations, cutting women open without anesthesia. It's, it's, it's utterly horrific. And while some of that has calmed down a bit, but not completely um, among the Han Chinese, it's happening in, 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 um, in Xinjiang, but it's still happening among the Han Chinese. I want to say that in a Radio Free Asia report that came out a couple months ago where they were focusing on Xinjiang, they mentioned that according to a, an official Chinese Communist Party report, 8 million extra births is what they call them, were, were eliminated, terminated uh, in, the, in the main part where the Han Chinese are. So they're continuing with forced abortion. And Just Reggie, so to, to this point, um, in addition to this forcible termination of pregnancies, there's this incredibly intrusive, coercive monitoring of the menstrual cycles of women that you've taught me about, too. Just a quick word on that. And we'll turn to uh, how this is playing out in Xinjiang and, and with respect to the population of China. Well, at its height, and you know, they, they have family planning centers in every you know, neighborhood and also in, in, in every workplace. And women's menstrual cycles were monitored. How are they monitored? Well, I heard somebody say that in, 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 the, in their factory, um, once a month, women, they had like this 
family planning cadre in the women's bathroom and they would have to go and show their toilet paper to her so she could say, yes, you're having your period. Unbelievable. It, it's uh, the impact on the family, the impact on the individuals, of course, is just horrific as a result of all of this. Jesse, just a, a quick word on Xinjiang. This is where the Chinese have been brutally, uh, well, oppressing the uh, people of that region. It's called East Turkestan by the natives. Um, how is this uh, forcible abortion and population controlling impacting that particular community? They're doing the same thing to the people in Xinjiang today that they were doing at the height of the one-child policy, namely uh, forcibly aborting women uh, up, up to the ninth month of, of, of pregnancy. And there was a report that came out recently from Radio Free Asia of medical personnel that had escaped Xinjiang and were saying that they were committing infanticide, that full-term babies are born and just killed if they go beyond uh, the population control mm -hmm. limit, which is two and three, depending on where you are. But, um, and, and they're doing things in Xinjiang that they didn't do in, in the main part of China, which is they are interning people. They're putting them in internment, basic, basically concentration camps. And Frank, one of the things that people need to know about is that they will typically, a lot of times they will, in, they will intern the husband and then they will move a Han Chinese man into yes. the home yeah. of the woman and the family to sleep with her in her bed. And, and, and so this is like rape. It's state, state arranged rape at that. Um, the horrors just are almost limitless, uh, Reggie. And we're going to be talking with you in the weeks ahead about uh, the nature of this Chinese Communist Party and its conduct, because I, one of my central tenets in all of this is any country, any country, communist or otherwise, that treats their own people this horrifically has to be assumed to be likely to be even worse to ours. And we ignore that at our really extreme peril. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Reggie Littlejohn, and the terrific work that you do at the Women's Rights Without Frontiers. I look forward to our further conversations with you. Needless to say, it'll be shocking but necessary to us all. Next up, human trafficking with Tracy Bradford here on Securing America.
Welcome back. I'm pleased now to be able to also extend a welcome to one of America's great freedom fighters. Her name is Tracy Bradford. She is the former president of the Texas Eagle Forum, an organization stood up by the unforgettable uh, Phyllis Schlafly. In that capacity, she worked tirelessly and for years to help ensure that Texas and our country remain free and secure. These days she's working with the national level Eagle Forum to help combat a particularly odious scourge of our time, and that is human trafficking. Tracy, welcome to Securing America. It's so good to have you with us, my friend. Thank you for having me, sir. Good to see you. So let's level set first on this. Uh, what is meant by the term human trafficking? And give us a sense of the magnitude of it in our country at the moment. Well, human trafficking, as defined by our State Department, is any uh, service where you have been coerced, forced, or even fraud was used to uh, put you into a situation for a labor purposes or sex acts. And I think people would be shocked, shocked to find out that there are between 25 and 35 million trafficking victims around the world. In Texas alone, we have estimated about 250,000 labor trafficking individuals, where we have around 75,000 at any given time minor children in trafficking situations in just the state of Texas. Wow. That's actually staggering. Uh, not it just surprising, it, it's, uh, it's shocking in the extreme. And, and when you're talking about these children and sex acts, I mean, you're basically talking about them being forced into prostitution, I guess, and, uh, yep. and servitude of the worst imaginable kind. Um, and Tracy, I'd, I'd like you just to spend a minute talking about what this does both to the individuals most immediately victimized by human trafficking, but also to their families and, and to the larger community as well. I, I don't think we can um, grasp the magnitude of the impact on our communities. When you have children going missing, when you have one in six children that go missing are in trafficking rings. When you look at the statistics and you look at what these children are put through, um, the first thing that grabs my heart is, is just life, human dignity. They're treated as possessions. If you're a parent, I can't imagine what it must feel like to know that your child is in that situation. Um, trying to, re to get them out, the statistics are one in a hundred that they will be rescued. Wow. And how can we not, as a nation, um, question the numbers that we're seeing um, the impact that that has, not just on the children, but as they grow up, their life expectancy is shorter. Mm. The cost uh, from labor trafficking as well to the communities is in the millions. And this is a $35 billion industry. Oh, my Lord. So $35 billion. And that's that's going into the hands of who are these? Are these uh, cartels? Are they uh, uh, gangs? Are they various, uh, you know, business operations that are are running these uh, these All horrible rackets across the board? But there are cartels. Billion dollars. They have found. Um, I believe it was from uh, Contraland. The, the the man that did that video talked about how there are seventy to seventy five different cartels running human beings up through the state and the thing about that is you know they know that they can sell drugs and weapons but that's a one-time purchase with a person you're able to sell them again and again and the statistics on what a child could go through in a day the number they shoot for is 10 to 15 clients a day oh my god for, for children as young as 13 some are younger but the, the target age is 13. So, as you say, as a, as a parent yourself and as I am, uh, the, the thought of this actually happening to someone you love is unimaginable, yeah. and to anybody else for that matter, being so terribly mistreated. Uh, very quickly, Tracy, what's being done now to try to stop this? I, I know that Ivanka Trump, among others, is making this a very high priority for the first family, but um, how's that 
effort to counteract these uh, gangs and cartels and so on uh, proceeding as, as you see it at the moment? Education is critical. Getting information into the hands of people, which our, our state, actually our Attorney General's office, has done, his uh, team has done an excellent job on resources. Yes, sir. Um, I would say anyone watching in your state, reach out to your Texas or to your attorney general and, and see, do they have a task force? Uh, sheriffs, our count, my county sheriff is doing a wonderful job with task force, reaching out to groups that are already on the ground. Um, something we want to do is build a grid of all the different services because there's so many groups out there, small pods working together mm. would be a, a bigger force. Right. Uh, I think the education part's critical and getting individuals like the people watching your program to know they they can literally make the difference. Talk about that. What In what way and, and how best to do that? There are stories and you will see, you can see on some of the training videos where a person saw a, a young girl screaming in a car and this was in a very small town in Texas. And she just knew it was wrong, something felt wrong. She called 911. Come to find out, you ask about who's trafficking, well, cartels, but you also have somebody, a mother, was trafficking her children. Oh my this, this particular case, they found a woman in a very small town, I think it was a population of 3,000, trafficking people through that town. So it, 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 so being it able to just bring common sense to bear and yes. actually bringing to the attention what your common sense has identified as a problem, mm -hmm. the authorities can then intervene and perhaps not just rescue an individual, but maybe even bring down a larger operation that is trafficking that individual and heavens knows how many others. Um, Tracy Bradford, this is enormously important work. We appreciate what you and Eagle Forum are doing as part of that larger enterprise of groups trying to make a difference in this space. And I hope you'll keep it up and come back to us with further updates and reports. Uh, God knows it's needed. And I want to thank the rest of you for joining us for today's edition of Securing America. I hope you feel better equipped to join us in doing just that. For more on what you can do, visit our website, securingamerica.tv. You can also follow me at Twitter, at Frank Gaffney. And I hope, after all that, you will go forth and multiply. <laughs>